Hello everyone, my name is Mike, welcome back to the YouTube channel and today we're continuing learning more about the songs that we've covered in Sabaton Week and we're having a look at Sabaton's history of Shiroyama, the Satsuma Rebellion. Looking forward to this, let's get into it. So yeah, so as we left off on the Shiroyama song reaction video, I said that I didn't really have a huge knowledge of kind of the Satsuma Rebellion, I only had a very thin layer. Um, indeed, I only really had a thin layer of Japanese history as a wider whole, practically up until the 20th century. I try to provide what little insight I can, but that's why I'm so looking forward to getting into this, and kind of learning a bit more both about Japan and the Satsuma Rebellion, and I believe it was Saigo they mentioned in the song. I don't really know who he is, so I'm looking forward to find out who this man is. Equally so, I'm trying to remember Indy Nidel and Joachim from Sabaton, because I couldn't remember them in the Ghost of Trenches, what their names were, so. Uh, with that in mind, subtitles are on, link to the original video will be in the description. Please go over, check them out, support them on Patreon and stuff like that, and uh, let's learn some history. Nidel, and I'm Joachim from Sabaton, and this is Sabaton History. The Battle of Shiroyama was a major turning point in Japanese history, where the samurai, heavily outnumbered, made a heroic stand and counterattack against the Japanese army, showing their legendary skills for the world to see in their final fight. And our song, Shiroyama, is not only about that battle, but also a tribute to the ancient code of honor, Bushido. Now, in a minute, he's going to tell you a bit about the song, but first, I'm going to tell you the history. In the 7th century, Japan took a major step towards an era of feudalism with a series of reforms. Not really going to go into it here, but these not only reformed the classes, they also redistributed land among local lords, who in turn taxed much of the local population to live and work on said land. Over the centuries, those feudal lords eventually became rich and powerful, though that was not the reform plan, and the emperors became more or less figureheads. To defend their position and their wealth, the lords depended upon skilled warriors who called themselves bushi. We call them samurai. The lords built their power bases with their own private armies, and early medieval Japan saw clans and families rise and fall as they fought for power. A new era began in the late 12th century when a clan leader named Yoritomo seized power and proclaimed himself shogun. And this elevated the importance of the bushi to a higher level as the military arm of Japan, a new warrior caste, was officially born. The era of the samurai would last for hundreds of years. And you can look up all the ups and downs of the power of the shoguns versus the regional warlords, the daimyo, for yourselves. The samurai were not simply armed thugs that pushed around the locals, not for the most part, anyhow. They usually bound their lives to a code of honor and merit. One such set of rules to live by, next to the Book of Five Rings and the Hagakure, was the Bushido. The Bushido speaks of a code of morality and principles that every honorable samurai must follow to be respected and valued in Japanese society. Central themes, next to the mastery of martial arts, are honesty, dignity, and loyalty to their master. It's the nature of time that the old ways must give in. It's the nature of time that the new ways come since in. Well into the night. Okay, so just before that gets there, so yeah, so as I said in the Shirayama video, the kind of code of Bushido is somewhat, I, in my mind, uh, the easiest way to compare it is to the chivalric code of European uh, medieval knights, which is supposed to, like Bushido, again, as it said, this honour code, how you're supposed to act and conduct yourself. In theory, chivalry was supposed to act the similar way, you know, it was type of be, you know, the whole idea of being chivalrous, so it would be the type of idea of uh, showing mercy, being kind to those who so as well certain types of people you know women the the elderly the clergy um and various types of things like that as well as martial prowess however um as we know in kind of european medieval history and stuff like that the romanticized version of what we think of the chivalric code in knights um at the end of the day their job was essentially still to be military officials and they were able to do that to extreme prejudice when they needed to um, and the kind of chivalric code kind of went out the window depending on what knight you're talking about now i don't know as i said i'm not an expert in uh, in asian history really in particularly japanese history and that's why i wonder whether um although bushido was kind of the the thing you know the the in thing that people were supposed to do i wonder if there was outliers in that just as there were outliers in 
kind of medieval European history with the chivalric code, where knights, although they're supposed to follow this strict con- uh, code of conduct, still uh, raped and pillaged, still sacked churches and stuff like that, raped women, you know, when you know they were supposed to protect them and all types of things like that. I wonder if there was a similar kind of uh, instances in Japan, which I, I imagine there must have been somewhere. Um, but if anybody can provide any examples, particularly where any of those happened, or if you know any notable individuals, then I'd be uh, interested to learn more about them. But uh, but yeah, uh, let's pick it up. I'm really enjoying this. I'm learning a lot because, as I said, my, my knowledge in kind of Japanese history, particularly pre-20th century, is, is fairly lacking. 18th century, the samurai class, within the rigid Japanese class system, remained powerful and enjoyed the privileges given them by the daimyo. But as the 19th century progressed, the shogunate was challenged by new ideas and social reforms and was finally toppled by the imperial Meiji Restoration in 1868. Mutsuhito, the Meiji emperor, aimed to revolutionize Japan by adopting Western ideals. He pushed democratic reforms and established the constitutional monarchy. This broke the feudal structure and sabotaged the existence of the samurai. By abandoning the old caste system, and caste isn't really the right word, but class isn't really either. Anyhow, hundreds of thousands of samurai, some sources say up to two million, were suddenly out of a job. And worse for them, they were now socially equal to the common man, as the law now made all men commoners. Yeah, so going with this as well, you know, the whole, what I do know is the samurai were kind of restricted from taking up other forms of employment. Uh, their, their job as a role were were warriors, were kind of soldiers. And, you know, peace is bad for soldiers, particularly when you can't change to other jobs, but particularly here as well, because suddenly now they went from kind of a being, not the ruling class, but a an influential class. And suddenly, as I said in the Shirayama video previously, uh, merchants, for example, were the bottom rung of Japanese society. They were put below things like artisans and peasants because it was viewed that the, the merchants were just kind of um, siphoning off of other people's work, the work of the artisans, work of the peasantry, and then selling it. So they, they looked as the merchants were beneath them. But now suddenly, as Japan has opened to more this Western model, suddenly the merchants have found themselves shooting up in importance because of foreign trade and stuff like this. And that's even more of a kick of the teeth, particularly to samurai again, who, as I said, are increasingly with more and more that Japan is becoming westernized, suddenly finding themselves pushed further and further away from kind of the heart of Japanese society. This turned the whole social hierarchy upside down. Japan was by then under increasing pressure from the Western colonial powers. European and American ships were already probing the Far East to exploit potential weaknesses. And Japan had to shed its old skin and enter the modern era or fall behind, opening the country to modern technology and ideas. By any standard, Meiji saved Japan from the fate of the continental Southeast Asian states that ended up either colonized or torn apart like China. His main foreign policy achievement was to strengthen Japan to the point that they could resist the unequal treaties. The reforms he carried out on the home front contributed to this substantially. The emperor's new conscript army, for example, would rely on mass firepower instead of individual skill with the sword, and it would answer only to the central government, with no allegiances to local lords. Yeah, so just pausing that there as well, there's two quick things I need to remember or talk about there as well. As he said, the the reason why the Japanese emperor kind of embraced this Western force, one, because I feel like you've actually probably had to. I mean, you just need to look at, uh, at China being torn apart, uh, you know, things like the Opium Wars, for example, you know, when China tried to resist or when these nations tried to resist kind of a technology, a technologically uh, superior foe, it kind of doesn't go well. Um, and you only need to look... At the, at the things like the Philippines as well, who were colonized by Spain, but then um, as America kind of like 1898, they they took over the role and they was under their boot heel. So Japan, it was kind of like adapt or die. Um, and the the Japanese emperor, I think to extent to his credit, kind of realized this and understood that the best way of protecting Japanese sovereignty was to embrace as much Western ideals as he could, because then he would use that to kind of make themselves the best defense as they possibly could with that modern technology, with those modern kind of uh, martial practices. And as well as what he said was the army was built on uh, mass firepower rather than skill. And that is ultimately why uh, things like the bow 
uh, cease to be a thing. I mean, I, as I've said in previous videos, I am an avid archer. I, ha I own several bows myself. I uh, very much enjoy the practice. But it's the reason why that even in the age of, uh, like, muskets and matchlocks, that type of thing, where you're thinking it's taking, you know... It, three rounds a minute is is a good fire rate whereas a bow you can loose an arrow practically a, sp a skilled archer can loose a bow every three to five seconds um and the reason for that is because it takes years of practice to get good at a bow and equally in terms of you know japanese history you know you think samurai train with with sword or with naginata or with yari um or whatever weapon of choice they use for years to get to that level of martial prowess Whereas you can hand a peasant a gun and within an hour or so, he has a general idea of how to load it, how to fire it. Now you give him training for about a month, you can bet he can do that very well. You give a peasant a sword and you put him up against a skilled opponent, he's going to need a lot longer than a month to kind of get good at it. Or at least a lot longer than an hour to get good at it. And this is the whole idea of you know, warfare now at this point doesn't necessarily come down about skill. I, I'd argue it comes down to two things, and that is technology and tactics. The individual skill of a warrior is still important, but with gunpowder, gunpowder is the great equaliser. It's the same reason why knights in medieval Europe didn't, like, you know, kind of disappeared. They didn't start wearing all this steel armour that was extremely expensive and, you know, time, like, time taken to make suddenly became irrelevant when... Uh, a peasant can put a round of lead straight through the centre of it and kill the, you know, the princely noble behind it. Um, and so, yeah, so so Japan is going through a huge series of modernisation. Essentially, in in this period, Japan goes through a couple of centuries of technological advancements in in a span of a handful of years. It, it's mental. There were many powerful clan leaders that supported the emperor as it was their traditional duty. One such man was Saigo Takamori. He had played a large part in the Meiji Restoration and supported modernizing Japan's military. But he also hoped the samurai could still hold on to their power in the countryside. This was not to be, and Saigo left his post as an imperial military advisor and retreated to his own domain of Satsuma Kagoshima on the southern Japanese island of Kyushu. Now, he was opposed to the new structures of Japanese society, but did not seek a confrontation with the emperor's rule. Instead, he kept the ideas of Bushido and the samurai alive in his own schools and dojos. Side note here, contrary to popular belief, the samurai did adopt new technologies. In fact, clan Satsuma was famous for its artillery school. Okay. It was soon obvious that imperial officials loyal to Saigo were unofficially supplying his schools with ammunition and military-grade weapons, and this, this raised deep concerns at the imperial high court. Investigators were sent out, and these openly accused Saigo of preparing a rebellion. This was an insult to Saigo's students, and some of them committed local acts of violence against government officials. By 1877, this spiraled into open war between the samurai forces of Satsuma and the Imperial Japanese Army. Saigo gathered warriors and students loyal to him and marched out of Kagoshima in early February to meet the approaching Imperial Army in the field. But he made a strategic mistake that doomed the rebellion from the start. He wanted to first take Kumamoto Castle, one of the strongest castles in all of Japan, north of his realm of influence. He thought it would surrender to him without a fight. But the officers of the castle remained loyal to the emperor. As he laid siege to the castle in winter conditions, the imperial army arrived. Both sides were initially around 10,000 troops each. And for two months, the battles raged mostly in close combat with swords and bayonets, and the losses were in the thousands. But the Imperial Army, under General Aritomo Yamagata, an old colleague and friend of Saigo, could easily replace conscripts by the hundreds, while samurai warriors, who had trained their whole lives with their weapons, could not do so at all. Despite their far greater skill on an individual level, the rebels were forced to retreat. Still. It was a fighting retreat, and the remaining samurai waged a relentless guerrilla war, but they could not run forever. By September, it was only Saigo and 400 of his samurai 
who managed to slip through the imperial lines and make their way back to their capital of Satsuma, taking refuge on the heights of Hill Shiroyama. It did not take long for the Imperials to catch up, and General Yamagata was determined to finally capture Saigo and crush the rebellion once and for all. He ordered his men, some 30,000 strong by this point, to lay siege to the heights. So just quickly there, I just want to say, again, that's linking back to the point that I said, that the samurai who had trained their entire lives on an individual one-to-one -one basis were far better soldiers than conscripts. But... For one, you can replace conscripts a lot easier, and two, as I said, the training and stuff required for a conscript to become extremely dangerous. That's my doorbell. Apologies. Oh, well done. Apologies about that, I am back. Um, but as I was saying, the training for conscripts to become incredibly dangerous is much lesser, or much less time, much less effort, than what would be considered traditionally dangerous. You know with the it takes years to master a sword it makes takes years to master a bow it takes a matter of weeks to master a, a firearm and that is you know the the kind of nutshell of warfare advances not just in japan but you know globally or over is the kind of story of the domination of gunpowder and it's never really got away i'd argue perhaps now you know you have a domination of air power and stuff like that and that's what's more important than the individual guy on the ground but Practically, the moment that gunpowder actually started becoming efficient is when all other forms of kind of martial prowess just kind of went out of the window, in my opinion. So let's get back to the video. They surrounded Shiroyama with a complex system of earthworks, trenches, and barricades. Yamagata sent out an envoy with a letter demanding Saigo's unconditional surrender. That letter shows the deep affection and respect the imperial general held for his friend and you can read the letter in the description saigo true to the nature of bushido could not accept surrender and denied yamagata's request see for the samurai surrendering was the most shameful thing they could do a warrior was not just remembered by how he lived fought and served he was also judged by the way he met his end death even in defeat could be the most honorable and glorious act of a samurai's life. And after all, death is inevitable, but giving up or losing heart in the face of defeat is not and is unacceptable. Knowing the end was near, Saigo and his men spent their final days singing songs, writing poetry and playing games while the Imperial Army prepared its assault. Its artillery began to fire at midnight as September 24th began. The samurai wished each other farewell and shared a last cup of sake. At 3 a.m., Imperial infantry stormed up the hill. The samurai charged, forcing them into close combat. Now, they could not hope to match the skill of the samurai and took huge casualties and their lines fell into disarray, but numbers were on their side. By 6 a.m., only 40 of the samurai were still alive. Saigo himself had been mortally wounded, probably from a bullet to the stomach or the hip, though that is uncertain. The legend goes that he was carried back up the hill by one of his closest friends. As they found a quiet spot, Saigo turned one last time in the direction of the imperial palace, bowed, and then got to his knees. He committed seppuku, the traditional suicide, by slicing the abdomen open to preserve his honor. His friend cut off Saigo's head with one stroke and hid it somewhere on the mountain. In the morning sun of September 24th, 1877, the remaining 40 samurai met their fate in one final suicidal charge into the imperial lines. All of them were cut down by gunfire. The defeat at Shiroyama not only meant the end of the Satsuma Rebellion, but the end of the samurai. Japan had entered a new era where such warriors had no place. From now on, the Japanese would wage war with an army made of recruits from all classes and all backgrounds. Saigo Takamori remains a tragic hero whose dedication and skill will always be remembered as examples of the best of his kind, the samurai and his code, the Bushido. Shiroyama, the song, obviously is going to have a certain meaning for Japanese fans and stuff. Do you guys play in Japan? Yes, uh, we played there four times since 2015, actually. 
And what about before that? Uh, never. Really? <laughs> yeah. time? Okay. We never had the timing. We always wanted to go, but it just never happened. But uh, the song Shiroyama, that was a uh, sort of an unexpected, like big crowd pleaser for you guys, right? Yeah, uh, it was. I was really happy because I really liked the song. It's got this kind of '80s movie theme, uh, you know, vibe to it. Not only the Japanese, but fans from all over the world took it sort of to their hearts. So even while we were on the last down tour, which Shiroyama is from, it actually made its way to the encores at the end because it was so popular. And that is... Really? Not, and not being a single? Yeah, and not being, being a single. But that's what people want. And from the new album, you know? Yeah. So thank you for that, fans. That was... So what would, what would an encore be uh, on the last down tour? What, what, how many, two or three songs? What do you guys do as an encore? On the last run of this tour, we did uh, usually Primo Victoria as the first one, could be, and then into Shiroyama, yeah. and then finishing up with uh, To Hell and Back. To Hell and Back. Yeah. That's fantastic. See, now you guys learned something that you did not know about Sabaton. Although some of you probably did know that. Yes. So. Everyone who went to the concerts, actually. Yeah, everyone's like, <laughs> I went. I had to. Okay, sorry. Um... <laughs> All right, well, once again, Shiriyama is on the Last Stand album. And that's all for today. But we will see you next time and every time on Sabaton History. All right, soldiers, you know the drill. Subscribe. Sabaton History, regular Sabaton. World War II and Time Ghost. Playlist. Click. Click now, soldier! And now... Patreon. Good one. And on the ground, and give me 20. Oh, well, you just heard your game. Um, but yeah, so I, as they said at the end, though, they rely on sport. So go, if you're not already subscribed to Sabaton, Sabaton History, and all those uh, World War II and various other things and projects there, then go over support them. Obviously, you know, Patreon and stuff, if you could support them financially. If you're not already doing so, I don't know why you're here, then go support them. Um, and, you know, because what they do is cracking stuff. I've learned a lot of stuff from the two Sabaton History videos I've looked at in uh, A Ghost in the Trenches and this one. And, you know, and s the story of Saigo here is it's a... It is a tragic uh, story in regard because it's it's kind of the end of a culture. It's, it's an end of a way of life. Um, and I feel like, in an extent, I, we don't really know... Nobody knows, definitely for now, how exactly the samurai was, whether... Uh, the samurai was, in a way, you know, just like a medieval knight where they had that code, but did they really follow it, all of them to the extent? I think from my own perspective, I feel like samurai were more likely to follow along the tenets of Bushido necessarily than all knights were willing to follow with the chivalric code. Um, however, having said that, you know, it's, I feel like whenever a culture dies or a, a a way of life dies it always becomes more romanticized anyway you know the the dream of what could it be and it's you know everyone loves an underdog and when you paint it on the 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 idea just generally speaking samurai versus modern guns you know it is the underdog story that you that that we love to learn about that we love to hear and i feel like again it's it's an important part in the kind of birth of a nation and you know that was the kind of birth of modern japan if you will now as we know it uh, more so today going into the 20th century and then onwards and so yeah so that that was really cool i really enjoyed that and what they said as well is a big crowd pleaser what i have to say is although uprising is still probably my favorite song and i still do like aces in exile this is definitely up there i do actually really like uh the music itself and i know you don't necessarily watch this for me to talk about the music but i actually really do actually like the as he said the kind of 80s kind of movie action hero kind of uh, theme track almost and I really love that I, I love the chorus as well in it um it, yeah it's just, it's just a pretty fun song as well to listen to um but yeah so that's been uh, me looking at a Sabaton history Shiriyama about the Satsuma Rebellion and Saigo um but as always thank you ever so much for watching I hope you've enjoyed uh, I hope you've learned things like I have learned things here and I hope to see you in the next one thank you ever so much for watching please stay safe bye bye